Thank you for tuning into my YouTube channel. My name is Alana and on this channel, I share my love of books with you guys. And we talk about um, book reviews and all the fun nitty gritty things and symbolism and themes that we find in the books that we read. And today I'm going to be sharing my top 10 favorite books currently of all time. So I'm going to start doing this annually and keeping record of it because I think it would be interesting to track how my top 10 books change over the period of my life. I would anticipate that next year some of these may get bumped off the list. I have a feeling that there are a few of them at least that will never get bumped off this list. Um, but when I was thinking about this list, I'm very confident in these being my top 10 because these were the only 10 that came to my mind. Even though there are other books that I love, if I had to get rid of all of my books and I could only keep 10, these are the ones. And I think these are the ones that I could reread over and over and over again and get something new out of them every time. So let's dive into this. These are going to be in no particular order other than the very first one that I mentioned, which is going to be my favorite book of all time. I thought that was going to fall. Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte. I've read this book three times and every time I read it, it just gets better and better. I plan to read it for a fourth time this year because I want to read it and annotate it. Ooh, I almost dropped that. As many times as I've read this book, I've never annotated this book. So I want to go through and have a copy in which I've highlighted my favorite quotes and pulled together certain symbolism and symbolisms and themes. And I've never reviewed this book also. So that's another reason why I'm reading it this year. This is the gorgeous vintage classics edition. I have four copies of this book. Nobody needs that. <laughs> but Jane Eyre, I, I have a hard time sometimes explaining why Jane Eyre is my favorite book. I love the character Jane. She is young and smart and witty. She, I don't always agree with her logic and some of the decisions that she makes, but I, I can't stop rooting for her. I love that she stays, she never strays from her convictions, even when, I'm not going to spoil anything, but even when she's dealing with Mr. Rochester, there are certain things that she never compromises on. And I love that she stays true to who she is as a human being. And it's not done in this angsty, whiny, woe is me way. And that is a trend that I've seen in Charlotte Bronte's heroines. The same goes with Villette, who, and which is actually Charlotte Bronte's last published novel. It's actually the better novel in a lot of ways. Villette is, well, better written. And that's hard to say because Jane Eyre has fantastic writing. But you can see that Charlotte Bronte was really coming to the height of her skill as a writer. But... There's just something about Jane Eyre. It's a little bit more youthful. It's a little bit funny. Villette, Villette is a little bit funny, but Villette is bleak. But in that story, I got sidetracked. In that novel, again, Charlotte Bronte creates a character in which she never strays from her convictions and she never feels super sorry for herself, regardless of the horrible things that she goes through. So Jane Eyre. Ross Poldark by Winston Graham. I'm going to make sure that I'm centered here. This is digging into my shins. <laughs> um, when I began watching the Poldark series, I actually didn't know that they were books. And then I think I was probably halfway through the first season when, you know, there was this card that came up or the slide or whatever that came up on the screen. This is based on the books by Winston Graham. I was like, what? I need to find out. And so in 2020, I read the first book. And I still think about this book. I, as soon as I finished reading it, I wanted to reread it. There's just something nostalgic about this book. The way that Winston Graham writes, it's a bit ethereal. It feels a bit cathartic. And he has such a way of describing scenery, his characters, what his characters are feeling, the way that his characters interact with each other. Another thing that he's really good at, and this just occurred to me, he's a master at showing, not telling. There are certain instances where he could really go into a lot of detail about how a character is feeling in that particular moment or 
go into more descriptive more descriptions about what another character is perceiving from another character and he doesn't he gives you just what you need and then he fades to black and that takes a lot of restraint for a writer to do and that's what makes these books so evocative it's just in the first book in particular i've read up through the seven of the 12 12 of them hopefully i can get to the eighth this year but there's also something cozy and nostalgic about this story. And if you've watched the TV series but haven't read the books, you will still feel like you're experiencing the story for the first time. It's just such a treat. And when I'm I'm in the mood for something that is cozy and familiar but still just really excellent storytelling, it's Ross Poldart. This is what comes to my mind. And all of these books are on my top 10. Another reason why is I've had some type of emotional response with all of these. No other book has done this. No other books other than these 10 currently have done that. Not necessarily. Some of them, I definitely cried a little bit, got a little misty eyed. Some of them, not necessarily did I have a, like an outward emotional response, but I had to kind of stare at a wall for a few minutes to get myself together. <laughs> Outlander by Diana Gabaldon. This is why I reread books when I get the chance to because over time as you mature you become you not only you mature as a human being who has experienced more life thanks um but you also mature as a reader you're able to pick up on more themes symbolism etc etc and this read this time of this book, I picked up on so much more. I cannot wait to review this book. It's going to take me a while to get my thoughts together. I've already outlined all my notes and then I got to write it and that's going to take quite a bit of time. But Diana Gabaldon, like Winston Graham, is a master storytelling storyteller at showing, not telling. There are times where Diana Gabaldon gives you so many gory details. This book is graphic I'm not gonna lie it's graphic but there are also times where she's incredibly restrained as a writer and it's so poignantly done it's so evocative the characters are just as strong as the plot I just cannot rave enough about this book this is pure escapism but at the same time when I'm craving something that I want to be able to analyze the amount of annotations in this book and post-it notes that are in this book. I cannot wait to review this. I feel, I feel like right now my assessment of it, of why I'm claiming it's a top 10, is kind of cryptic. I'm still processing. <laughs> I'm still processing my second reread of this. But I had a book hangover and I almost never get book hangovers. Um, yeah. And now with Diana Gablin is just a good writer. This is her first novel. Before this, she was writing scientific papers. I think the woman's just a genius. I have To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee. The first time I read this book was in 2015. This was, oddly enough, I never had to read this book in high school or middle school. This is often required reading for American students. But I read this of my own volition. And then when I reread it in 2019, my eyes are so dry. So if I'm rolling my eyes, I'm, just, I'm actually trying to discreetly mo moisten up my contacts. <laughs> um, but when I reread this book in 2019, it was even better. This book touches on some heavy topics. Racism is at the core. It talks about racism during this time period um, in the uh, in in the South, I believe, Alabama. This book takes place in Alabama, but it takes place from the you know it talks about these topics from the perspective of children, primarily Scout, who is our narrator. And is there's just something about Harper Lee portraying these heavy topics and difficult topics from the perspective of the innocence of youth, youth that breaks down certain that breaks down racism in the justice system and assessing ourselves of human beings and how we treat other human beings. That is just perfectly executed. It makes me sad that. There are now school districts in the United States that have banned this book because it uses offensive language or it talks about difficult topics. 
Isn't that what reading is supposed to do? Aren't we supposed to read things that make us feel uncomfortable? If you never get uncomfortable in life, how are you going to grow? <laughs> so I don't get that. I, 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 I don't get that. I'm not here to, I'm not here to go on a tangent about that today, but if, again, if this was a book that I had, if I had to get rid of all my other books, this is definitely one that I would keep. And it just gets better and better with each, each read in the court case at the end. There are no words. A Tree Grows in Brooklyn by Betty Smith. This was a buddy read in 2020 that I did with one of my really good friends. We buddy read books with, together throughout the year. Rebecca, if you watch this, hi. <laughs> um, she lives in a, the same area as I do, so that's always fun too. And we were actually friends, but that's just such a ramble. We were friends before we started buddy reading, but we started buddy reading together, so. Let me, let me, let me keep it moving. So A Tree Grows in Brooklyn is a coming of age story about, um, oh my gosh, I forgot the main character's name. My, I've, I'm, Francie. Francie's our main character. I have been really spacey today. My, 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 my thinking isn't quite as sharp. So Francie is coming of age in New York City in the 1910s. So right at the cusp of World War one and i think it covers about a decade of her life if not a it, it, this whole novel comes full circle from beginning to end she's it starts when she's in the single digits and ends when she's a teenager and francie is a lover of books and she's a lover of writing she wants to be a writer and a lot of people say that nothing happens in this book well that's the point like oh i wouldn't say that nothing happens but again you're following this woman young woman growing up in New York City at this time. She's not from a wealthy family. She definitely has some family issues with her father. She has a really, really funny brother. Her mother is super hardworking. And I just find this to be a really realistic portrayal of immigrant life in New York during this time. And it's excellently written. It's not overly, it's not, Betty Smith didn't overwrite, but she also didn't write too sparsely. It's descriptive where it needs to be descriptive. It's not descriptive where it doesn't need to be descriptive. And it's also hilarious. There are points in this book where I cracked up laughing in the end. Like I said, it comes around for a circle and I got a little misty at the end. I did. I felt like I grew up with homegirl and then the, move, the novel was over and I wanted more. Again, this is a novel that I think about all the time and I'm always eager to reread it, but I have so many other books to read. I will reread this one day. This is just such a joy to read. It's slow moving, but in a really calm, cathartic kind of way. I just really enjoy this novel. Yeah, let's keep moving. No surprise as this was in my 2021 top reads of the year, The Brothers Karamazov by Dostoevsky. This massive beast of a novel. Again, this book is complete and utter brilliance. This is, I just, Dostoevsky. I want to be his friend. I know he's dead, but I want to be his friend. <laughs> this just the way that he's able to dive into each brother's life. If you don't know, so this is a story about four brothers. The father is murdered, and one of the brothers is assumed to be the murderer. One of the brothers is a murderer, but which one is it really? And each of these brothers are very different. One's an atheist, one's a devout, um, devoutly religious, one's a bastard brother, the other is an intellectual, um, except one's, well, the atheist is the intellectual. And there's one who's just a bit too rambunctious, if you will. He's a bit helter-skelter, if you will. And the way that Dostoevsky dives into debates and topics about religion and philosophy, atheism, socialism slash communism. Um, he, the devil makes an appearance in this novel, which was one of my favorite um, sections in this whole novel. There's an epic court case. If you like the court case and To Kill a Mockingbird, I actually found them very similar in some ways. Dostoevsky talks about fatherhood and being a good parent, what it takes to be a good parent, that's paralleled with 
this is how I interpreted it, paralleled with um, Mother Russia, if you will, and the state of Russia at this time. And you could read and analyze this book for an eternity and you're going to get something new every single time. I just found this to be very evocative, insightful, and I definitely had a bit of a book hangover. I read Crime and Punishment last year after reading, shortly after reading this, and I was still so hooked on The Brothers Karamazov. I don't feel like I enjoyed Crime. I enjoyed Crime and Punishment, but I felt like I was, this was in my mind and I kind of should have spaced them out maybe a little bit more. I don't know, but The Brothers Karamazov. I will re be rereading this book at some point in my life. I wouldn't mind rereading a different translation just to compare the two, but there are just so many good debates and this book goes on. There are whole blocks of text that take up just pages and pages. They're conversations and debates. And if you like philosophical debates, you will like this book. We have a Dickens who's made it to the top 10, A Tale of Two Cities. And I love this cover because if you don't know, I'm a grandma and I like to knit. <laughs> I am a knitter. I'm a, I'm a self-proclaimed grandma. Let's keep it moving. I read this book at the beginning of 2020 before the world changed, <laughs> if you know what I mean. And at the end of 2019, this book kept popping up everywhere. Tale of Two Cities, Tale of Two Cities, Tale of Two Cities. I saw it on the news. I saw it randomly in movies. I dreamed about this book. I kid you not. Um, people would randomly bring up this book in conversations at the end of 2019 and I had already planned to read this book in 2020, but because it kept popping up in weird areas in my life, I was like, I'm going to bump this book up. And I read it at right at the beginning of 2020 before lockdowns happened and everything got very uncertain. And this book Yes, it's about the French Revolution and you've got London and then you've got Paris, which is why it's called A Tale of Two Cities. At the core, this is a novel about friendship and relationships and the sacrifices that people make for each other for the sake of the greater good. And this novel, when you're reading it on the first read, you're kind of like, what is Dickens doing? I'm not really getting how everything is adding up. What's the point? I like what I'm reading. It's well written, but where is this going? And then right at the end of the novel, everything starts to click in place. And there's something that happens that is so heartbreaking, but so beautifully done. I cried. I'm not, not, oh, I'm, I cried. And then at the end, I had, when I finished the book, I had to put it down and, and stare at a wall. But another, and, and the fact that I got that kind of emotional reaction out of a book, which usually, doesn't usually happen to me, that's why it stayed with me. And that's why I can't stop thinking about it. Another reason why this is a favorite is because the opening paragraph is iconic. You know, it was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness, etc., etc. And that is one of my favorite paragraphs in the English language, period. It might be my favorite paragraph ever in the English language is definitely my favorite opening to a book. And I'm getting a little cheesy, but bear with me. In the midst of 2020 and all the uncertainty, even now when I kind of watch the news, I try not to watch the news or pay attention to too much or get too obsessed with what's going on because there's only so much that you can do. You end up just worrying. <laughs> um, that chapter, not that chapter, sorry, that paragraph would keep coming back to my mind. And I would reread that paragraph throughout the year of 2020. And it was very comforting to me. When you think about, excuse me, I burped. <laughs> when you think about, you know, we get so caught up in the, the current affairs and what we're dealing with. But when you look at human, uh, the human condition since the dawn of time, there is not a period of time on this earth where human beings have not gone through crazy, scary, uncertain times and circumstances. So it's very comforting to read that and say, okay, this is not the first time the world has been in chaos. You know, social media didn't exist then, <laughs> but I don't know. I found that really comforting. My boy Chuck, 
my boy Chuck. This should be of no surprise. This was my top read of 2021, A Little Life. Again, I cannot stop thinking about this book. This book ironically did not make me cry. <laughs> Which this book is known to make people cry. But there were definitely some moments in this book where I was like, ah. This book is so beautiful, it's so heartbreaking. What I love about this book is that Hanya Yanagihara gets down to the nitty gritty of what makes life hard and what makes life beautiful. And when you combine those two things, that's, why, that's what creates a well-rounded life in general. Life is hard. Life has good times, life has bad times. Some people get dealt really bad, circumstances in life other people seem to cruise through life but put that together this is a story of friendship the rough times the bad times all the things that make life ugly all the things that make life beautiful she does it in such a gorgeous way this woman can write i mean man again this is a book that when i finished reading it i wanted to immediately go back and reread it. And ever since I finished reading it, I often find myself picking this book up, flipping through, going through some of the passages again. I think of a theme and then I'm like, oh yeah, well that can connect this and blah, blah, blah. This book, actually I connected a lot to the book Lolita. I saw a lot of similarities. So I love it when a book makes me connect other books. So I will reread A Little Life for the rest of my life. It's that good. I get why some people can't stomach it, but for me, I just couldn't put it down. The Secret History by Donna Tartt. My chin itches. This was a top read of 2021. <laughs> um, one of my top reads, it was in the top three. This book is so twisted, it's so bizarre. It's, a, it's, a, it's not a who done it, it's a why they done it, <laughs> in which these, these college students murdered their friend and it, it leads up to the why. They ended up doing this horrible thing to poor Bunny. Um, that's not a spoiler. You know it's Bunny from the get-go. And Donna Tart is a genius. There, I, I love a book that is smart. And I love a book that drops so many breadcrumbs that it's impossible to get all of those breadcrumbs within the first read. And I am a big fan of ancient Greek and Roman texts. This book is filled, full of, um, it pays a huge homage to them, of course, because these, these students are classic students. And again, this is a book that I gave me a bit of a book hangover. As soon as I finished reading it, I wanted to go back to the beginning and look for more clues. It's evocative, it's moody, it's very 1990s New England. It's a bit pretentious, which is part of its charm. It's supposed to be pretentious because of this, the setting that it takes place in. And one reason why this book has a spot in the top 10, not just because it's intelligent and well-written and quirky and bizarre, and some of the characters are not quite likable, but this book reminded me of how much I love the ancient texts. I hadn't read any of the ancient texts in a long time since I had graduated, since like graduating from university. And because of this book, I went on a bit of a rabbit hole last year, rediscovering some of those texts. And I don't know, I feel like I created a bit of a, a connection. Is that cheesy? It's a bit cheesy. But again, I love dark, moody, novels it's definitely dark academia but again I just appreciate what this novel is and like A Tale of Two Cities it's one of those novels where I could read it for a lifetime and still probably not pick up on all the clues one day I hope to go back through A Secret History or sorry The Secret History on a reread and annotate it to oblivion Editing me here, I realized that that was nine books and not ten, so my last book is Stoner by John Williams. I'm going to keep this brief for the sake of time, but this is at its core an existential novel, and that is one of my favorite types of novels. I love existentialism in a novel, and we have a main character who is constantly having this tension between the brilliance that he perceives within himself 
in this lackluster life that he seems to lead to lead and you see that in his work and in his, his relationships i'll make sure to leave links to all of these novels down below so you can read my full thoughts but i definitely wanted to squeeze in stoner by john williams so those are my top 10 books currently um, i'm curious to see how this changes next year what was a weird position i'm curious to see how or if this book if this list changes next year um I have a feeling that some of the books I could imagine War and Peace that I'm reading this year bump off one of these books. I could see maybe Swan's Way, Marcel Proust bumping off one of these books. Maybe A Gentleman in Moscow. That's my prediction. We'll see. If at all. I don't know. Um, I'm going to always try to keep it as a top 10, not a top 20, because the top 20 gives me a little bit too much wiggle room. I'm trying to keep it strict. So... Yeah, let me stop rambling. This is way too long. Um, <laughs> if you have read any of these books, let me know if you like them or if you didn't like them. I would also like to know what are some of your favorite books of all time. And if you could keep, sorry, if you could only keep 10 books that you own out of all the books that you own, what would they be and why? So thank you again for tuning in and joining me on this long video. I hope it made sense. And if you would like to follow me on Instagram, my link is below. If you would like to read my book reviews there, if you would like to read my, or prefer to read my book reviews on my blog, the link to that is down below. I would also appreciate it if you liked, subscribed, and leave me a comment in, uh, down below. <laughs> and I am now tired. My throat is dry. I've been talking for an hour. My eyes are dry. I'm going to go head on and stop talking.